After being engrossed in a fantastic story, one of the more exciting aspects has to be attempting to process everything that just happened. In the purest of forms, this often relates to analysing every narrative beat and lore detail. But when some aspects are left ambiguous, one of the more intriguing facets becomes the opportunity for theory crafting. These discussions often delve into speculations about the true fate of characters, or they seek to explain various phenomena within the game's world. And over the years, it's led to some wild but very well-developed theories being created, and some of the more notable examples have suggested that, for example, Jar Jar Binks was a powerful Sith Lord, or that the machines were actually the good guys in the Matrix. Quite often, the creators of the original works stay silent on such theories, as they either like to see the online discourse that happens, or they're unable to. But sometimes, creators choose to debunk theories, and this can happen in rather blunt fashion. In this regard, Final Fantasy is no different. Over the years, many popular theories have arisen, and although we've often seen the developers take a passive stance towards addressing them, sometimes they have taken a more official stance. And it's those instances that we'll be discussing today, as we're going to run through some intriguing fan theories that the developers have refuted. So strap yourselves in, as we're going to kick things off with one of the most elaborate Final Fantasy fan theories ever created, which relates to the Piteos dungeon. But before we do, a message from the sponsor of this video, Opera GX. Over the past four years, Opera has been attempting to revolutionise browsing the web via Opera GX. Their tagline is simple, a browser that's designed for gamers. And to demonstrate this, Opera GX was not only launched during E3 2019, but it also packs in a lot of different functionality. One of the more intriguing features is GX Control. This allows users to control CPU and RAM utilization, something that can make it much more efficient compared to other browsers on the market. Then there's GX Mods, which allow users to customize the aesthetics of Opera GX. And as demonstrated by this medieval theme mod, you can adjust background music, keyboard typing sounds, and even general colour themes. Opera GX also has a quick import tool, which will carry over browsing history, bookmarks, and cookies from other browsers, and it has compatibility with every Chrome extension. If this sounds like something of interest, please consider downloading Opera GX for free via the link in the description below. And with that, let's talk about some theories. Optional dungeons are nothing new in Final Fantasy games. These special endgame locations have often featured powerful regular enemies, super bosses, and very strong gear. And while some of these have been added in via updated versions of the games, there have also been plenty of optional dungeons featured within the base games. Some of the more prominent examples in this regard have to be the Sunken Galnica, the Deep Sea Research Center, and the Omega Ruins. And what's intriguing about these particular dungeons is that they each had subtle narrative elements that allowed fans to tie pieces of lore together. But even though they were memorable locations, none of them would end up holding a candle to the now infamous Piteos Ruins. This endgame location, which appeared in the base version of Final Fantasy XV, was far more secretive and difficult to access than any previous dungeon. Players would need to use the Regalia Type F, and they would need to then navigate their way to the hidden location and then land the Regalia without crashing. Once there, something quite marvellous awaited. Inside the ruins were unique structures and challenging platform puzzles, but the most intriguing aspect was the specific nature of the architecture that could be found within, and it was this architecture that would end up forming the basis for an intricate and detailed theory. The theory was posted by a Reddit user called Perona77, and it posited that the Piteos ruins was constructed by the astral Ifrit, used as a way of illustrating the Infernian's attempted journey to save the life of Aeos, the goddess of dawn, and the unfortunate and tragic release of the Star Scourge. Due to how well crafted this theory was, it garnered a lot of attention amongst the immediate community. And this was then amplified when it was covered by mainstream video game publications, YouTubers such as Final Fantasy Peasant, and even Ray Chase, the voice actor for Noctis. Everything seemed to make perfect sense, until it didn't. Later that same year, the game's director, Hajime Tabata, was asked about the Piteos ruins when attending PAX West. Tabata shared that the dungeon had been designed by just one person, an artist named Hiroyuki Nakamura, 
and the objective was to leave a lasting impact on players by creating something that was unexpected. Tabata would seemingly dismiss the Pidios theory as part of this, stating that broader details relating to Final Fantasy XV's lore would actually be elaborated upon in upcoming DLC. Some elements of this went live as part of Final Fantasy XV version 1.6. However, after the initial Reddit user contacted the author of the original editorial piece, it became clear that larger elements of the theory had actually not been debunked by Tabata. However, when Episode Arden released in 2019, the game unveiled the ruins as being part of the ancient Solheim civilization, and this would end up debunking the elaborate Pityos theory. Final Fantasy VIII has been a haven for fan theories and one of the more popular revolves around the concept that Squall was actually dead for large portions of the game. On face value, this sounds quite nonsensical. After all, how could the main protagonist of the game be dead without the player even knowing? But as shown by Rahel Chowdhury and Deirdre Ratta, the authors of the theory, within the game itself, there are a surprising amount of oddities that can be difficult to explain and when positioned in the correct way, they do help to present quite a compelling argument. The basic premise for the theory is that Squall dies at the end of Disc 1 after being struck by an ice shard, and that everything that happens afterwards is based on a perceived reality as opposed to being the true reality. From that point forward, the narrative and lore of the game would undergo a significant tonal shift, and we'd be introduced to fantastical beings that related to the Shumi tribe, such as Norg and the Moombas, and Renoa would seem to change the object of her affections from Cypher to Squall. Then there was the game's ending, which would see key scenes from the game interspersed with images of Renoa. But instead of being fully formed, her face was blurred out and her form kept disintegrating and reappearing. In 2017, Yoshinori Kitase, the director of Final Fantasy VIII, was asked about this theory, and he gave an interesting response. In the initial sense, Kitaze stated that the theory was not true, as the injury Squall sustained was not fatal. However, Kitaze also stated that the Squall's dead theory was a very interesting idea, and that if they ever did make a Final Fantasy VIII remake, they might try to incorporate elements of the theory somehow. Final Fantasy VI featured a large ensemble cast, and they each possessed their own intricate backstories. But with these intricate backstories all weaving together, some fans felt there was often more than met the eye, and started to establish deeper connections between the main characters. In this regard, one of the more interesting conclusions was a theory surmising that the true identity of one of the optional party members, Gogo, was actually Daryl, the long-lost love of Setsa Gabbiani. As the story progressed, we learned that Setsa's rival and lover, Daryl, had crashed during a friendly airship race. It's never actually confirmed that she did die though, as no body was ever found, and the specific location as to where the crash happened was never confirmed. This led to fans theorising that Daryl could have survived, and that if she did, Triangle Island, the location where Gogo could be recruited as a party member, was a viable location for the crash to have taken place. Gogo was a mysterious character who had almost no backstory. And this theory offered a deeper and more intriguing connection between the new party member and the existing party. The game had also set a precedent around this type of narrative too through the introduction of Shadow. What was also interesting about this particular theory was that on GameFAQs, a user called Chantran99 created a thread presenting evidence for this theory to be real. The evidence was that dialogue from the Japanese version existed between Gogo and Setsa and that Gogo would unveil their identity as Daryl. They claimed that due to localization and translation discrepancies, this scene remained inaccessible in international versions. Moreover, on the Final Fantasy fan site Caves of Nash, a user named Snoopy Boy shared a post claiming to have engaged in an email conversation about the theory with Squaresoft. In their post, they detailed a response from a Squaresoft customer relations team member called Michael King. King purportedly mentioned consulting a game tester and a developer with seven years of experience at Squaresoft regarding the theory. And according to King, the developer hinted at the possibility of a cutscene that exclusively occurred when Setsa and Gogo were in the party. Yet the authenticity of this entire exchange remained uncertain, as the detailed and comprehensive translation of Final Fantasy VI's Japanese script did not include any such scene. Even so, fans would cling to the theory 
that is, until Katarze put an end to speculation. Katarze explained that even though many characters did feature strong backstories, the scenario team had been purposeful in providing no definitive backstories for Gogo and Umaro, as their sole purpose in the game was to provide another combat option for players. Now when thinking back to some of the most incredible and unforgettable summons, the conversation never goes far without mentioning Knights of the Round from Final Fantasy VII. Appearing as the game's strongest summon, its ability, Ultimate End, wielded such immense power that with the right material combinations it could defeat almost anything in the game. And it was because of this that acquisition was quite tricky, as players would need to acquire a gold chocobo and then make their way to Round Island. In light of its immense power and cryptic location, Knights of the Round would remain rooted in mystery, and it would become a popular topic of discussion, including the creation of theories. One particular theory would allege that Knights of the Round were actually the very Cetra that defeated Genova 1000 years prior to the events of the main game. The hypothesis was quite fascinating and well thought out, as it would take into context the identity of the Cetra as an ancient race predating humans that were recognised as the stewards of the planet. Their virtual extinction would however effectively occur at the hands of Genova, the strange entity that somehow landed on the planet and used its parasitic abilities to great effect. The last remaining members of the Cetra would ultimately overcome the threat of Genova, sealing it in the northern crater. Considering the incredible strength of Knights of the Round, fans therefore link this to how the entity of Genova was sealed away. This association would also provide an explanation for the unique existence of summons throughout the world. But however interesting and elaborate this theory seemed to be, Kataze wrote it off. In his mind, summons were just summons. And in this instance, fans have been thinking too deeply and reading between the lines far too much. The rather curious element here though, is that although in the context of the game's lore, this particular element was not true, that wasn't always the case. Kitase shared that during development, they had actually thought about summons fulfilling a similar role to the one proposed in the theory, but they just decided to nix the idea and had them being entities that simply existed with no sort of backstory attached to them. When Stranger of Paradise was first announced, fans were surprised by its fresh and unusual vision. It led to numerous memes being created that centered around Jack's obsession with chaos and as the promotional cycle continued, this kind of commentary showed no signs of slowing down. But even though this was a large portion of discussion, it wasn't the only kind of discussion taking place, as the game's other unique properties would lead to fans theorising that Stranger of Paradise must be some kind of isekai adventure, as Zack seemed to be from another world. While many were being intrigued and perhaps a little perplexed by this take, it was starting to become a popular subgenre within video games around that time. Numerous other games included this narrative device, including for Spoken, which was being produced by Square Enix themselves. The evidence around Stranger of Paradise was quite clear. The game seemed to have a very traditional fantasy setting, but the protagonists were dressed in modern clothing that was similar to our reality. This was further emphasised by Jack using a portable music player and playing Limp Bizkit-esque music. Fans would also point toward Jack's forward to the point demeanour and an unwillingness to entertain the mythical entities he would face. It just seemed like Jack was not from that world and did not understand the expected customs. But alas, even though these theories were fun for a time, they would be dismissed by the game's producer, Jun Fujiwara, a few months before the game launched. In an interview with Inverse, Fujiwara said, It's not meant to be an isekai story, sorry. We understand that people may have seen the protagonist's outfits, which seem very modern compared to our typical high fantasy, and may have had that interpretation. This was a pretty definitive statement, but the game would still hold quite a few secrets around Jack. So even though Fujiwara was telling the truth, there was still a slither of merit to this theory. It just had to be looked at through a different lens. Now, it was mentioned earlier that Final Fantasy VIII has been a hotbed for theories over the years, this saw rise to another popular theory that suggested that the game's main heroine, Renoa Hartilly, was also the game's main antagonist, Sorceress Ultima Sia. The initial impetus for this theory was the striking visual similarity that existed between the two characters. When the in-game renders were merged together, it became clear that their face maps were nearly identical. 
Alongside this, the lore was scrutinized with an incredible level of detail, and some key elements were extracted that helped to provide solid evidence. For one, Renoa did become a sorceress during the natural events of the game, something that meant her lifespan would exceed that of normal human beings. This would then suggest she had the potential to outlive the rest of the party. As time passed, the theory suggests that even though Renoa was a pure-hearted and kind-natured individual, her memories would become warped and twisted, something that would be influenced by her utilization of guardian forces. The only thing that remained was a desire to be reconnected with Squall, something that she hypothesized could become a reality through an advanced piece of magic called time compression. On the surface, this seemed like a bit of a stretch, but there were in-game elements that were hard to explain, one of which was Griever, as its name was tied to what the player named it before they faced off against Adia. Kitaze would be asked about this theory point blank by the Edamame Arcade channel, a YouTube channel sponsored by Square Enix. During the segment, Kitaze was asked to answer true or false, and in the case of Renoa being Ultima Sia, Kitaze said false. The intriguing detail here, however, is that Kitaze walked back his views. One year later, Kitaze was taking part in a live stream to promote Dissidia NT, and the topic of Renoa being Ultima Sia came up. This was perhaps because there were elements of Renoa that had been transposed into Ultima Sia within earlier Dissidia games, and Takeo Kuchiraoka, the director of Dissidia NT, noted that they had toyed around with how they could have some fun with this theory when working on the PSP versions. Kitaze, however, said he'd first heard about the theory when he was asked by the Edamame Arcade channel, and that he was somewhat caught off guard by the question. With more time to ruminate, Kitaze stated that from his perspective, there is no direct evidence in-game that they're intended to be the same person. But many other individuals such as Tetsuya Nomura and Kazushika Nojima worked on the script, and they may have different points of view. It saw Kitaze retract his blanket debunking of the theory, but he would still reiterate that he did not personally believe the theory was true based on his interpretation of the story. And that then brings us on to our last theory, which relates to Aerith Gainsborough, and the theory that there was a legitimate way to revive her. This theory gained significant weight, because the death of this particular character sent shockwaves through the video games industry, and such was its impact that Japanese fans even drafted a petition to try and force Square to allow for a way to bring her back. Unrelated to the petition, rumours also started to spread that there were indeed ways to revive Aerith, and numerous pieces of evidence were used to try and verify that these rumours were true. For example, there was a piece of key art that showed Aerith standing in front of the Highwind, something that should not have been possible from a narrative perspective. To take advantage of these rumours, fans posted numerous claims as to how they had been able to revive Aerith. One such example noted that they had been able to achieve this feat by levelling up all characters, including Yuffie and Vincent, to level 99 before Aerith's death. This would then lead to the party confronting Sephiroth and saving her. When asked about all of this, Kitase shared that he was aware that fans were discussing bugs that could enable Aerith to either survive or be revived. However, his response reflected the development team's intentions, emphasizing their desire to depict human life realistically and convey the concept that people do not return after death, and that because of this, there was no legitimate method of bringing Aerith back. And with that, they were seven prominent Final Fantasy fan theories that ended up being debunked by the developers. But which of these theories would you like to believe is true regardless? And are there any others that you feel will be worth discussing in the future? Let us know in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, feel free to hit that like button and subscribe for more content. All right, everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to thank all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Adam Aguilara, Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Galsin D. Kujata, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Sukun TDK, who are super special Onionite supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.